And now on the line is Senator Pauline O'Reilly. Pauline is the leader of the Green Party in Shannon Aaron. Pauline, welcome back to Near FM. Thanks, Darren. Okay, Pauline, I last spoke to you on Near FM just over two months ago. And in that interview, we spoke about the North Seas Energy Corporation deal that was reached in Dublin that month. We're going to talk today a bit about last week's COP27. I have an interest in in environmental issues, Pauline, but I'm nowhere close to being an expert on the area. But I was following a lot of the news about COP27 uh, while it was on, and I read the editorial in the Irish Times a few days ago about it. Uh, I'm not sure if you read it, but I imagine you did, but would you agree with the editorial in the Irish Times a few days ago, Pauline, and that to quote Mary Robinson, that quote, the world remains on the brink of a climate catastrophe despite what was agreed at COP27? I think that that's probably a fair assessment, Darren. Um, there were, there was in particular one very important thing that was decided at COP27, and um, that was to set up a fund for what's called loss and damage um, for the developing countries who have suffered most because of the climate catastrophe that's already happening um, all around us, but particularly to those countries along the tropics. And they have suffered massively. The richer countries are the ones who have been predominantly the ones who have been putting the greenhouse gases into the the air and yet they're not actually suffering to the same extent then from from the results of that so that was really momentous that that fund after decades has been set up um, and Minister Eamon Ryan was asked by the EU to be the lead negotiator on that so um, we were pleased with that, that there was progress I think that there are some other areas where there was, uh, I would have some concern, and that was because some of the things negotiated last year at COP, some countries came back and tried to renegotiate and get out of some of those things. But fortunately, for the most part, um, they didn't manage to do that. So I think that that has to be looked at as a success. But one thing is, is quite clear, and that is that we are still moving towards climate breakdown and uh, and and so there's a lot of work still to be done. Yeah, I read a report a few days ago that this fund for countries who are affected most by climate change will run into the trillions of dollars. I don't know how accurate that is, but I also read that um like funding for these countries was actually promised years ago, uh, but it wasn't actually delivered. So, uh, can we be optimistic that it's this money announced uh, for these countries is going to be enough? And do you know how much it's going to be? Well, that was one of the things that wasn't finalised. So uh, one thing that was finalised, and it was actually very difficult to get countries on board with this, was that a fund would be set up. But you're quite right, $100 billion was already agreed some years ago and, um, and, and developed countries haven't paid that money over to developing countries. So... Now there's a proper process in place um, and people have signed up to follow this process and to do it this way. I have also seen the estimates that have come that um, that if we were to truly deal with the climate crisis globally, it would run into the trillions. Mm. And I think that that's understandable that it, that it would. Now, my understanding is that's not purely into a loss and damage fund, but that it is to, to deal with the consequences overall. Um but I was at Rome in last year for, for COP27. COP26 was jointly held by Rome and Glasgow. And I was in the parliament in Italy and speaking about this very issue of the 100 billion that still hasn't been paid to the uh, to the countries most impacted. And, um, you know, it's it's very it's it's very uh, disheartening because I was in a room um, in the parliament with parliamentarians from the very poorest countries in the world who were there and they were pleading with the richer countries to actually um, step up to the plate, you know. Okay, just to talk a bit about Ireland, Pauline, are you confident that we will reach our environmental targets in Ireland by 2030? Well, um, certainly I think that we are, um, we're putting in place all of the measures that need to be put in place. Uh, The emissions are still going up and what we want to do is slow that down and then um, see in the next 
you know, after a couple of years that it's it's starting to reduce more rapidly. Uh, one area where there's a lot of work going on is in um, offshore renewables. So we've set up uh, the MARA, which is a regulatory body to ensure it's, it's a little bit like a planning authority, but for the sea. And that's been set up now. That was a problem in the past. And so when we came into government, that's what we did. Um, and we are seeing now that there is um, a huge amount of work that's that's uh, about to kick off now um, off our shores. Mm. We are at 40 percent of our electricity is comes from renewable energy. And we um, have said that we want to get to 80 percent by 2030. Um, and I was at an event yesterday with the Taunish, the Leo Varadkar, and he is saying that he believes it's achievable. If not by 2030, it would only be a year or more um, after that for the for the for the 80 percent. And I I I, def, I certainly believe that that's achievable. Um, there are other areas where I think it's it is very challenging, and one of those is in transport, um, because every time we do try, our local authorities try to put in things like cycle lanes, you have objections, you have councillors voting against it. Um, in Galway, that's a problem. It's also been a problem in Dublin. And so those are the challenges that we really need people to understand that this is an emergency. We have to move faster on those things. And um, it is going to be uncomfortable. It, it it does mean that we can't use our cars as much. We will be taking car parking spaces away in order to make sure there's room for bus lanes and cycle lanes. But that's the right thing to do. And it's the right thing to do for future generations. Yeah, I spoke to you only a couple of months ago on Air FM about um, the uh, renewable energy, electricity. Um, I know, like, I've covered this in issues a few times over the last year or so, the Horn of Africa food crisis, which is uh, a lot of it is down to climate change, I believe. And I was reading reports today about in uh, Northwest uh, America, the continent, there's huge uh, drought there as well. Uh, mega drought, they're calling it, is the worst in 1,200 years, which is unbelievable, I think. Uh, to look at the global picture, Pauline, who are the biggest laggards on environmental issues in the world today? Uh, like, I mean, who do we need mm. most to make the positive changes? I think it's, is it the US and China? Well, yeah, just for, firstly to say, I mean, it, it's absolutely devastating to see um, the the devastation in the Horn of Africa um, and it certainly isn't the people in the Horn of Africa who are at fault when it comes to climate change but they are suffering and dying as we speak because of climate change because of these uh, ongoing droughts over many many years and the lack of food and so on um, the US has a, a huge role to play um, and I think you know particularly under Joe Biden um, he had shown a willingness to do that. Now, the, the uh, House of Representatives has shifted back into Republican control just about, um, but at least he, he did manage to hold on to the, to the Senate. Um, but it, it will be more challenging to try and get through some, uh, some reforms in the US. China is also a major player in this, but so too is, is the EU. And let's not forget that the EU also didn't uh, contribute as it should have done to the developing nations. And what happens is that these larger countries, they can uh, use their power to um, to develop contracts with developing countries that are more favourable towards themselves. So I would say those are the three kind of major, major players in this. But everyone is. Um, India also has a large part to play. I can imagine, um, hopefully, you can be proud of the role Eamon Ryan. Eamon Ryan represented the EU in the in COP, did he? He did. Um, so he was asked to be the negotiator on the loss and damage fund, uh, setting that up. And it was very difficult. There were very late nights and the civil servants were amazing, did a, did a fantastic job. Um, I met with Eamon last night and he was uh, very happy and relieved that the fund has now been agreed. Um so he, yeah, I think it's, I think we should be proud as a country that Ireland was seen as someone who could lead on this. And I think that we are now we have moved from the position of the, that famous word laggards, where we're no longer seen as laggards, 
but we still need to prove ourselves in terms of being leaders. We're um, we're moving in that direction and uh, having, uh, you know, the Climate Act, which we now have in place, climate yearly climate action plans. The next one's due out on about the 6th of December. All of these things demonstrate that Ireland really wants to move in the right direction. Yeah, I just have two more questions, Paulie. I know you have a very busy week this week. Uh, this is a huge issue as well. We haven't touched on it, I don't think, but something I'm interested in as well. And I, I talked to your colleague Pippa Hackett on your FM about it before. That's uh, biodiversity in Ireland. Is there much happening, do you think, on that, like that we can look forward to in the future? Yeah, well, I think that there is some really good news on biodiversity. Um, it's absolutely critical for for us in the Green Party. But I actually think more generally, um, I can see that a lot of communities put a lot of focus now on biodiversity, which wouldn't have been the case even five years ago. You see a lot of wildflowers around. That's really important. And I think the one good thing about biodiversity is it can come back. And... Um, one area in particular which Ireland has is it has 20% peatland. So there has to be a real focus on re-wetting peatland because that's the best way to store carbon, but also it's good for biodiversity. Um, there was um, an announcement of the Acres scheme, which is um, a scheme to restore nature on farms. And that will, um, that will give... Uh, money to about 50,000 farmers in the country and also it will support uh, biodiversity measures on their farms. So um, that's really good news because that's bringing everybody together and I certainly was at a meeting in Connemara where it was um, wall-to-wall farmers and I have to say they were all um, very favourable and thought it was a good scheme. So I think that I think that we are seeing a, a lot of work there yeah, in relation to the on, yeah. National parks and what in relation to the national parks and wildlife, we've doubled the funding there, um, and there are new biodiversity officers going into councils all over the country. So there's also work there, and look, there's an awful lot more. But I just thought I'd mention those couple of things. Mm, I'd love to see a lot more of Ireland uh, covered with forests. I don't just mean like commercial forests. Like I think it's ironic when a lot of people around the world think of us as being a green country, and we've one of the lowest figures for forestation, I think, in Europe. Uh, so. I'd love to see the day where um, there's proper forests that have m- 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 mixed, that are mixed. They're not just mm-hmm. all spruce or whatever it's called, uh, commercial forest. You have a forest grown just for the sake of biodiversity. I'd love to see more of that happening. Okay, uh, before you go, Pauline, uh, this interview on Air FM we played on Sunday, so it could be at the end of your conference. But uh, you have a busy weekend coming up, don't you, in the Green Party? <laughs> We have a very busy weekend coming up. This is our yearly convention, um, or some some parties call them our dishes. And um, so we'll be going to Athlone tomorrow, and I'll be chairing the weekend as the chair of the Green Party. And I'm really looking forward to welcoming members from all over the country. It's the first opportunity to have an in-person convention since uh, the pandemic started. So this is a really good opportunity to to come together and to have a um you know an experience that uh, that we've all missed out on for many years and the real focus for us this weekend is is to speak about that some of the things that we're delivering in government because we actually we have delivered a huge amount sometimes you can forget about that and um, when you're focusing on the next thing that you have to deliver but uh, we've we have a minister for child care Roderick O'Gorman and we'll have a a key um, speech from him and a session on him from him um, because we're delivering a 25% reduction in childcare fees from the start of next year and we hope then to further decrease it to 50% because crash fees have been outrageous um, in this country and that needs to be dealt with and it's, it's key for us in the Green Party um, that our Minister delivers on that which he is um, and other things such as you know, the reduction of 20% on fares and public transport. Again, that was the Green Party. Um, the National Retrofit Plan, that was the Green Party. So we'll be talking about all of these things and we, there'll be definitely some announcements throughout the weekend of new things that we'll be delivering.